Hey everybody, in this video we are going to talk about transaction modes and get into the debate about whether you should use explicit transactions or rely on auto committed transactions for data modification in SQL Server. But before I get into that, let's briefly lay out some of the basics around transactions. When you modify data with a command like insert, update, merge, or truncate, that operation takes place inside a transaction. A transaction is, according to Microsoft Docs, a single unit of work. Everything in a transaction will either succeed as a whole or fail as a whole. You won't end up with some operations succeeding and others not. It's really all or nothing. The importance of this goes back to relational databases having ACID properties. But because that's a little far afield of where I want to go, I'll give you a link if you'd like to learn more about the topic, as it helps explain why transactions are useful for relational database developers. What I do want to get into is that there are three kinds of transaction modes. Auto commit transaction mode, explicit transaction mode, and implicit transaction mode. Now, there's actually a fourth kind, batch scoped transactions, but that only applies to multiple active result sets transactions, and if you find yourself there, you've got bigger problems than deciding how you want to deal with transactions. In the upcoming demo, I'm going to show you each of the three primary transaction modes, including how you enable them, how you work with them, and any important considerations around them. So let's get demoing. Here we are in Azure Data Studio, where we're going to talk a little bit about transaction modes. First up is auto commit. By default, we are in auto commit mode, so transactions will commit after each relevant database operation. And I can tell how many transactions I have currently open by selecting at at tran count. Currently, I have zero transactions open. Now I can query a table. I have a large table, it's got IDs, and what I'm gonna do is query the table and then select tran count afterwards. So what we see is I've got some data and I have no transactions open. I can update the data. So I'm gonna set the character to F and select tran count afterwards. I run this, tran count is zero, and in a different session, I can still query that data, no problem. By the way, I currently have read committed mode, but with snapshot isolation turned off. So no read committed snapshot isolation. Let's talk next about implicit transactions. So something that's kind of interesting is that I have to pop over to Management Studio for this demo because it looks like Azure Data Studio actually ignores implicit transaction settings. See, I would turn implicit transactions on and the behavior would actually be the same as auto commit. That was kind of interesting to me. But here I am in Management Studio, which does support implicit transactions, and I select tran count. Tran count is zero. So we're going to select from the table, select tran count. Behavior really hasn't changed at all so far. Now, I'm going to update the table, set some chart to G, and then I will select tran count. Now my current open transaction count is one. Set implicit transactions on in Management Studio and other tools which support this will automatically slap a begin transaction before statements like insert, update, merge, create, drop, alter. So Anything that's a uh, data modification or data definition change, you're going to get a begin transaction added for you behind the scenes implicitly. And while this transaction is open, if I pop back to Azure Data Studio and try to query large table for that value, I'm gonna sit here waiting for a result. So we can see that the wait is on if I come back to Management Studio, I can run who is active, and it's going to show me that there is locking in uh, waiting for a lock, trying to query large table. So I'm going to have to roll back or commit this transaction. And if I forget to, because 
there's no visual indicator up here that says, hey, you've got an open transaction, you probably want to do something with it. Other people are going to wait. With read committed snapshot isolation turned on, we wouldn't see this waiting. We would instead see the other users getting the current version of data before my update. Let's roll back now. And I get the data back immediately. So that's implicit transactions. The third transaction mode that we're going to talk about here is explicit transactions. With explicit transactions, I call out begin transaction in my code. So I don't rely on a tool to create a transaction for me. I force the issue. So we're going to start off by pointing out I have no open transactions. I'm going to begin a transaction. We'll select our data, select tran count. I expect this value to be one, and then I'll commit the transaction, and we're gonna select tran count again. I expect that value to become zero. So let's do this. We have our data, we have the value one, and then as I come down to the bottom, zero. So works just as I would expect it to. If I begin a transaction, do my update, but don't commit a rollback. Well, behavior will be just the same as in the implicit transaction mode, where if I try to query this data, I'm just gonna be sitting for a while, at least until we roll back or commit. So I'll roll that back, and I immediately get back my data. Have to go to the results tab to see it. There's one other thing that I want to talk about, and that is the awfulness of nested transactions. They're a trap. This is something which, frankly, SQL Server shouldn't have. And I, there's a history around it, around why they were created, but they don't serve a good purpose. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna begin a transaction, and then we're gonna set the value for this ID 78723 to Z. Now, I want to nest this. In a new transaction, we're going to begin that and set 78724. I currently should have two open transactions. Here I am, I'm at two. So far, so good. I'm going to do it again. That should be three. Yep. And we've done all of the work we want to do four transactions uh, uh, uh. now if i commit a transaction well four minus one is three and boom everything is good and then if i say well you know what um i didn't really want to commit that one in the middle i'd like to roll it back and then i'll commit the last one so that way only some of the stuff got committed other stuff didn't get committed but you know, they're nested transactions. We can, we can handle this, right? If I roll back the transaction and my tran count, like this says, I'm expecting two, is actually zero. So commits decrement the tran count by one, rollbacks just send you back to zero. Also, we check the values that I updated. Remember, in each case, I set some char to Z. None of them are at Z. Everything rolled back. We had nested transactions, and even though we committed the inner transactions, it didn't really commit. It doesn't really commit until you get down to zero. So the fact that you hit commit, commit a couple of times doesn't actually fix anything, doesn't actually commit anything. And as soon as you roll back once, it's all gone. So nested transactions in SQL Server, that behavior is strange. I highly recommend avoiding it. There may be some reason that you may want to use it. I've never found a good reason to use nested transactions. I have found good reasons to write code to avoid them. And here's how we do it. 
let's say we have a procedure, like get a fraction. So we have a divisor that we're gonna pass in and I'm going to declare a bit already in transaction. So we're going to see, do we have any transactions open? And if so, I'll set that bit flag. Otherwise, I'll uh, set it that there was not a transaction already open and then explicitly open it. So instead of just writing begin transaction, we paste in this block. Then we do our activity. So this is where I would do the data modification. And at the end of my try block, I'm going to commit my transaction if I was not already in a transaction and I have a transaction open. If this was set to one, the assumption is some external caller actually did this. They actually opened up the transaction and we're going to let the external caller control that. So this way, maybe I have a parent-child stored procedure relationship where I have a parent procedure that needs to call several child procedures. Well, we don't want any of the children to commit because we wanna make sure all of them succeed or none of them succeed. So the parent controls beginning and committing a rollback. In the catch block, similar story, except at the beginning of the catch block, assuming that we own the transaction, we will roll it back. So let's run this. We've created the procedure and executing the procedure returns back data as we would expect. Now if I begin the transaction, and I execute. My tran count is going to be one because I will have the open transaction still. Uh, in other words, this flag already in transaction is set to one, so it will not commit at the end of my stored procedure call. I could proceed to do other things here like update other tables or call other procedures, and when I'm done, roll back or commit. So with that in mind, let's head back to the floating head and see what he has to say. Now that we've seen how each of the three modes works, I'd like to lay out my recommendation as well as my rules of thumb. The easy recommendation is don't use implicit transactions. For SQL Server developers and database administrators, this is unexpected behavior. The default is to use auto commit so that if you run an insert statement by itself, the transaction automatically commits at the end. If you set implicit transactions on, there's no real easy UI indicator that this is on and becomes easy to forget to commit a transaction. I understand that if you come from an Oracle background where implicit transactions are the norm, it might feel comfortable to enable this but it becomes really easy to start a transaction, forget to commit a rollback, and leave for lunch, blocking access to a table for a considerable amount of time. So let's throw this one away as a recommendation. My recommendation, whenever you have data modification on non-temporary tables, is to use explicit transactions over auto commit. I have a few reasons for this. First, consistency. Sometimes you will need explicit transactions. For example, if I need to ensure that I delete from table A only if an insert into table B and an update of table C are successful, I want to link those together with an explicit transaction. That way, either all three operations succeeded or none of them succeeded. Given that I need explicit transactions some of the time, I'd rather be in the habit of using them so the to build that habit, I'd prefer to use them for all data modification queries. Second, explicit transactions give you clarity around what is actually necessary in a transaction and force you to be clear about when you want it open. Suppose you query a table and load the results into a temp table. From there, you make some modifications, join to some other tables, and reshape the data a bit. So far, nothing I've mentioned requires an explicit transaction because you're only working with temp tables in your own session scope. When you take the final results and update a real table, now we want to open a transaction. By using an explicit transaction, I make it clear exactly what I intend to have in the transaction, the update of a real table, but not the temp table shenanigans.
Third, as an implication of the second point, explicit transactions can help you reduce the amount of time you're locking tables. You can do all of your heavy lifting and temp tables before opening the transaction, and that means you don't need to do that while locking the real table. Finally, if you use a loop, whether that be a cursor or a while statement, you can control whether you want one transaction per loop iteration or one transaction in total. That's entirely to do with whether you begin and commit the transaction outside of the loop or inside of it. Having one transaction in total can be considerably faster in some circumstances, but if you have an expensive action in the loop, you can commit after each loop iteration. This will minimize the amount of time you block any single operation waiting to access this table. It will increase the total runtime of your query, but minimize the pain to other users. And that's a trade-off you can only make if you use explicit transactions. So that's my argument for explicit transactions over auto commit, at least when you're modifying non-temporary tables. Uh, my more general rules of thumb fit in with this thought in mind. First, if you have a stored procedure, which is simply running a select statement, use auto commit. There's no real advantage to putting this into an explicit transaction, and there is the downside that you may forget to commit. If you have a stored procedure which performs data modification on non-temporary tables, use an explicit transaction over the area which modifies data. Don't begin the transaction until you're ready to start modifying those tables. This will minimize the amount of time you need to keep the transaction open. If you're working with non-global temporary tables beforehand, don't include those inside the explicit transaction. Now, if you're working with global temporary tables, well, you should probably treat them like non-temp tables here if you expect other sessions to use them and you care about blocking. Inside a loop, choose whether you want to put the explicit transaction around the loop or inside the loop. In most cases, I prefer to put the transaction inside the loop to minimize the amount of time that I'm blocking a single session. Also, if one loop iteration fails, you'll have less you need to roll back, so you can fix the issue and pick back up where you left off. Outside of a stored procedure, that is, when I'm just writing ad hoc statements in a client tool, use explicit transactions if you're doing something potentially risky. But to be honest, I'm not as consistent when just writing stuff in SSMS as I am when writing code for stored procedures, just how I am. Watch out for nested transactions. In SQL Server, there's very little utility in them and their behavior is weird. Check to see if you're in a transaction before opening one. Finally, make sure you roll back the transaction on failure. If you write code using try catch blocks, commit at the end of the try block or roll back at the beginning of the catch. Those are my rules of thumb around transaction modes in SQL Server. Let me know what yours are by leaving them in the comments below. And until next time, take care.